Yeah, um, is this working? Ah, it is. Uh, okay, so I've been told to say next slide, but okay, cool. I feel like Chris Whitty. <laughs> Remember when he used to, um, he used to get up and say next slide please, and a totally incomprehensible graph would come up, and you, you, you would try and understand it because you had this vague idea that you might die if you didn't. Um, yeah. um, okay, so what I want to talk about is, I want to talk about consciousness. So. Um, what I want to do is, I want to start off by talking about two things which are generally quite widely held, like most people who work on consciousness tend to agree with them. Then I want to talk about two different theories which have been developed in philosophy and cognitive science to try and explain what consciousness is. Um, and then I want to um, talk about some of the challenges that they face and finish with three wider questions for uh, consciousness science. Um, next slide. So I'll start with, whoa, <laughs> this bodes really well, this is going to go great. Um, so <laughs> I'm a philosopher at the University of uh, Birmingham, so I research philosophy of mind and philosophy of psychology mainly. I also do some work in metaphysics, uh, a bit of work in philosophy of biology and a tiny bit of work in logic as well, but mainly I work in philosophy of psychology and philosophy of mind. I'm especially interested in consciousness attention, perception. I've done quite a lot of work with psychologists on uh, peripheral vision, which I'm really, really into. I'm interested in infant consciousness and I'm also into robots and robotics as well. Um, of, those, of that list, the things I'm mainly into are consciousness and attention. So my PhD, which was a long time ago now, was on the relation between the two. I'm going to be talking about them uh, today. Uh, next. Oh, what's happened again? Okay, so, um, first thing you need to do, obviously, is to think, well, what, what is consciousness? So, I don't think that there is a good definition of consciousness. I don't think there is a good non-circular definition of consciousness. In fact, I think it's a mistake to try and define it. I think that's a bad idea, and it's something you shouldn't do if you're interested in researching it. So, I'm not going to try and define what consciousness is. I'm rather going to try and give some examples of the kind of thing I'm interested in. So, human beings have this very particular kind of awareness which characterises their mental lives. So you have thoughts like, oh, I wonder what I'm going to have for dinner. You might have sensory experiences like seeing a sunset or listening to music. So that music that we just heard, there was a very particular feeling, a very particular way that it sounded, which you have all been um, aware of at the time. We can all have conscious emotions like anger, happiness, fear, jealousy, and envy, and they all come with their own very particular fields. So if you imagine the feeling of anger, of like really intense, blind rage, that's totally different from the feeling of happiness, or the feeling of envy, or anything like that. Um, and then you might also have other things that characterise your conscious experience as well, like hunger and lust, and things like that. So these all seem to be part of our mental lives, which are characterised by a really particular kind of awareness. We're aware of these things in a way that there's a lot of stuff going on in our brains and in our bodies that we're just not really aware of. And these are the things which I mean by um, consciousness. This contrasts with a lot of the rest of nature. So, um, if you think about rocks, rivers, trees, cars, computers and so on, they're all really, really complicated. Rocks are really, really complicated things, but they're not conscious. That they don't have any kind of awareness of any kind at all. It's completely lights off to a rock. It's not even blackness to a rock, it's just nothing. There is nothing it's like to be a rock. Whereas for humans, there is something it's like to have these particular kind of, um, these particular kind of things. And that's what I'm interested in when I talk about consciousness. Uh, next, please. So, all of these kinds of things we can characterise as consciousness. And this is what I would like... Um, this is what I want to start with, is this idea that there's a difference between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. So this is the first idea that the vast majority of people who work on consciousness tend to agree with, which is that a lot of stuff goes on in the mind completely independently of our conscious awareness. So in the brain, there's a lot of processing that goes on, for example, in the visual system, which is completely locked off to us. It's completely, um, it, it's, we, we don't have any access to most of the work that goes on in the visual system. We only have access to the, um, at the results at the very, very end of the process. 
that's also something that's completely unconscious to us. Another example of something which is unconscious is the, the kind of the motor systems which control the movement of our limbs. So when I reach out and pick up this bottle of water or tilt it like that, there's a huge amount of calculation that goes on in my brain in order to make sure that that works successfully. So it has to compute the shape of the bottle, it has to work out how far away it is, and it has to constantly update and recalibrate my grip. Um, and then it's got to calibrate how strong my grip needs to be so that I don't drop it, but also so that I don't um, crush it as well. That's a huge amount of calculation, but um, it's not something we're aware of at all. My favourite example of this is, imagine taking an empty glass of water and filling it up from a tap. That's actually really complicated, because of course, the thing you're holding is constantly changing weight. So, the, if, you, if you were to just um, hold it um, with a normal sort of grip strength of a glass, then as soon as it gained weight, it would just fall out of your hand, because you wouldn't be holding it strongly enough. But on the other hand, if you just clamped your hand over it, it would just smash. So this, that's, a, that's the example of the kind of constant updating that goes on completely outside of your conscious awareness. Another possible example of unconscious stuff, if anyone's really into the work of Sigmund Freud, you'll know he had these ideas. Uh, <laughs> he, was, he, was a, a, he was an interesting um, fellow. So he had, this, uh, you know, he had these ideas that the, un, the unconscious was some kind of dark realm where we all had these dark desires and you know, he had this idea that boys all wanted to sleep with their mother and murder their father. And then almost as an afterthought, he, he, he wondered what might be going on in the inside of a girl's mind. and didn't really talk about that very much. And, but if you're a fan of Freud and Freudian psychoanalysis, that's the kind of thing that's unconscious as well. It's locked up to your conscious awareness. So consciousness is something that seems to be a characteristic of human um, activity, but it's probably not the only, um, we're probably not the only organisms that have consciousness. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, most people tend to think that we're not the only organisms in the world that are conscious. There are some people who think humans are the only conscious organisms, but it's very much a minority view. So let's just do a show of hands on each one of these. So put your hand up if you think human beings are conscious. Everyone's put up their hand. Okay, good. That's good. Good. Um, okay, let's go to some more mammals. What about cats? Do you think cats are conscious? Does anyone think cats aren't conscious? Anyone think cats aren't conscious? Oh, why? If you don't mind saying. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, yeah, I, I think they're very instinctual. Okay. Um, but I don't know. It's, it, it's difficult to, about upstairs, communicate with cats and to know are, are they thinking about their thoughts? Or is it just more interesting? Good. That may yeah. appear conscious to us because we're conscious. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, is it something you've got against cats? So, like, do you think dogs, you think dogs are conscious, but you're like, no, absolutely not, not them. <laughs> you like cats. Okay, brilliant. Let's leave mammals for a sec. Um, salmon. Ask salmon. Put your hand up if you think salmon are conscious. Oh, that's still most people. Uh, why do you think salmon are conscious? Uh, well, I mean, I've never interacted with salmon. <laughs> uh, Apart from at dinner time. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Except the point probably isn't. But, uh, I suppose I see no particular reason to draw a distinction between how a mammal navigates the world and how another sentient creature does. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, yeah, there's a famous um, old, uh, there's a famous paper where um, they put a dead salmon into a fMRI machine and um, it came out with the result that it was conscious, um, which is obviously wrong because it was dead. Um, and it was meant to show the limitations of the statistics that we used on the MRI at the time. Snakes. Put your hand if you think a snake is conscious. Okay, good. Who doesn't think snakes are conscious? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if you thought snakes were conscious but cats weren't, then it really would start to look personal. Um, let's go all the way to the other end of the animal kingdom, right, right the way far down on the tree of life to some of the most ancient um, insects that there are. Bees. Does anyone think bees are conscious? Yeah. Marshall, why do you think bees are conscious? Well, it's impossible to say for sure, but I think uh, it just it's possible to imagine being a bee and having a bee experience. So 
if conceivability entails possibility, then they are. Uh huh. Cool. <laughs> well, uh, no, because it's a commitment fallacy. It assumes that conceivability entails actuality. So it wasn't a better answer than yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bacteria. Anyone think they're conscious? Prokaryotic organisms. No nucleus. Just fluff. no one thinks they're conscious. Oh. My Oh, okay. Why do you think bacteria comes from? Uh, because they are living and they know how to survive. Good. There's a reason behind the consciousness. Otherwise, it wouldn't be survive. Good. Awesome, yeah. Does anyone think rocks are conscious? There are people like that. There are such people. Oh, Mark, you think rocks are conscious? Possibly. Yeah. Kind of devalues your belief that bees are conscious a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's degrees of consciousness. Uh, ah, good, degrees of consciousness, yeah. Do you think rocks are conscious? No, 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 but well, I want to oh, make right. a comment because the initial... Can we go back to the slides, please? Uh, you made initially the comment that uh, definitions are not important. And I think in you testing the level of consciousness on different uh, type of existences are dependent on what one understands yep. and believes is consciousness. So in that case, we might kind of uh, have uh, uh, different meanings and uh, we might not understand each other in terms of definition. Good. I didn't, say, I didn't say definitions aren't important. I said it's a mistake to try to define them. That's slightly different. I think it's undefinable, basically, is my problem with consciousness. Um, the idea is that consciousness is like an iceberg, and if this is the human mind, or indeed the mind of any conscious organism, only the elite stuff, the stuff at the very top, is, gets to consciousness. The vast majority of stuff is like the uh, iceberg below the surface, which is completely unconscious. That's the first idea that's really important. The second idea is to do with the relationship between attention and consciousness, which is that they seem to interact with each other really, really, really closely. Um, and so this is the... So there's, there's a, a huge amount of work in psychology which tries to test the relationship between attention and consciousness. That was what my PhD was on. But here's a much more intuitive way of getting it. So, uh, oh, good. So imagine you are, um, yeah, just leave it here for, for now, thanks. So imagine that you are, just imagine you're at a party and you're talking to someone. And what they're saying is really, really, really interesting. And everyone around you, what they're saying to each other almost recedes, it becomes like a battle. So you're talking to someone, they're talking back, and you're trying to concentrate really hard on what they're saying. Everything around you, that kind of just recedes away from your consciousness. You're kind of aware of it as babble, but you're not aware of the content of what they're saying. But then imagine someone from across the room uses your name, your first name, and that jumps out at you, and you're like, oh, they're, they're talking about me and your attention is immediately drawn to it, and that word penetrates through to your consciousness. Has everyone had that? That's called the cocktail party effect, for obvious reasons. And what it seems to show is that your auditory system must be processing the meanings of all those words around you, because it's filtering them out to test what's relevant to you and what's not. And when it finds your name, it draws your attention to it. And only the thing that your attention is drawn to becomes conscious. So what that seems to show is that attention and consciousness interact with each other really, really closely. At least sometimes, attention seems to be the thing that drags information from the unconscious bit of your mind to the conscious bit. There's a corresponding phenomenon which is more embarrassing, which is when you're talking to someone really boring, and you know that there's a more interesting conversation behind <laughs> you. So you start paying attention to it. And you, the person in front of you, they're right in the middle of your visual field. They're, they're well, easily within earshot. But you're not listening to a word they're saying. It's not even reaching your consciousness. That's a similar thing, where your, your attention is directing itself over here. So this is the stuff that's conscious, not what the person's saying to you. And then they always look at you really expectantly, because obviously you're meant to say something back. And you're just, you just gotta, you just, you know, you just gotta roll with it and say, yeah, that's great. Um, in the hope that they didn't just tell you their grandparents died or something, you know. Um, okay, so those are the two things that I want to start with. We've got this idea that the vast majority of the mind is unconscious and only the very tip is conscious. And this idea that attention is somehow intricately related to consciousness. Those are two ideas which are widely, they're not universally accepted, but they're very widely accepted. And those are the, the two theories I want to talk about agree with both of those claims. But there are a lot of theories of consciousness. So a recent article in 
the top science journal, Nature, lists 22 of the biggest ones, and they're just the biggest ones. Uh, next slide, please. But the ones that I want to talk about are global workspace theory and the higher order thought theory. Higher order thought theory is sometimes called hot theory for obvious reasons. Those are two of the biggest ones, but the reasons I want to talk about them is that a lot of um, theories of consciousness are quite siloed. So a lot of them are only discussed by scientists, or only by philosophers. Uh, some of them are only discussed by a very particular kind of scientist. Whereas these are two theories that have earned widespread respectability across both disciplines, which is why they're so interesting to me. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is the stuff on the cocktail party effect, so can we skip ahead, I think, two more slides? And again. And again. There's the cat again. There he is. <coughs> okay, so here are the two ideas. Most of the stuff in our brains is unconscious. Only a teeny little bit of it is conscious, the tip of the iceberg. And that attention seems to be linked to consciousness really closely. So we're going to start with them, try and build our theories from that. Uh, next. So the first, the global workspace theory is extremely complicated in its details, but very simple in its basic idea. So it starts with this idea here, which is that the vast majority of our mind is unconscious to us. Every single conscious experience you have is underpinned by lots and lots and lots of unconscious processing in your brain. So all the senses are like this, vision, smell, action control, bodily regulation, there's all sorts of stuff going on in your brain, only the tinsiest bit that is conscious. Uh, next, global workspaces theory basically picks up on a problem for a lot of this unconscious stuff, and then it says, well, consciousness's job is to solve that problem. And the idea is this, a lot of your mind, your brain, works unconsciously, but those unconscious systems here they're all processing lots and lots and lots of information, but they find it really hard to talk to each other. So the information tends to stay inside those unconscious systems, those individual ones. They don't move around inside the unconscious mind very much. Or it's actually probably slightly more correct to say they do move around, but the information moves on quite linear paths. There is information sharing between these unconscious subsystems, but it's very limited in how much it can do. Philosophers like technical terms, so they sometimes say it's cognitively impenetrable or informationally encapsulated. They basically just mean that unconscious systems, they seem to have a very dedicated task. They seem to be quite modular in that way, and there's not a huge amount of information sharing. Uh, next. So that is meant to be the idea that... Um, can we get this whole slide, please? That's meant to be the idea that... Um, oh, uh, go back. That's meant to be the, the thing that consciousness um, solves. So basically, you've got all these different um, subsystems. They're all working, and they're, they're, their information is relatively encapsulated. They find it hard to move between each other. And when they do move between each other, it's on quite a linear path. So consciousness is like a big blackboard in the brain where all the most important information gets put and once it's there, that makes it available to loads and loads and loads of different systems. That's the idea. So it's hard to get information across different systems. So you put it up on the big global blackboard, sometimes called the global broadcasting system. And once it's up there, all the other little systems get to look at it and they can access information from it if they need it. That's the idea, is to broadcast information across many different systems in the brain. Sometimes they're called consumer systems because they consume the information that's put up on the blackboard. Uh, next. So that was quite a... Uh, could we have some words, please? There we go. <laughs> so that was quite a, um, that was quite a, a quick um, summary of, of, of what the idea is. Getting a little bit more uh, technical, there's an area of your brain which is here, just above your eyes, called your prefrontal cortex. Uh, and... When information gets sent there, it gets um, encoded in this short-term memory system, which is based here. And when it's, in, when, that, when it's put in that memory system, loads of different systems can access it. So speech and language systems, long-term memory systems, cognitive systems, conceptual systems that, that underpin reasoning, they seem to be able to get access at it once it's here in prefrontal cortex. Um, 
obviously the details are a bit more complicated than that, but we can talk about that in, um, in, uh, in Q&A. Okay, so, I've, um, next slide please. So, remember we started with two ideas. The first one was that consciousness is only the very tip of the mind. Most of it's unconscious. Global workspace theory says, yeah, that's right. And they, all this stuff is great, but the problem with it is that these systems don't talk to each other much. So the purpose of consciousness is to put it somewhere central where all the stuff can access it. That was the first idea we started with. The second idea was that attention governs, um, attention governs what gets into consciousness. And that's also something we see in the global workspace theory. So an obvious question for global workspace theory is, well, if loads and loads of stuff is unconscious, what makes the difference between the stuff that manages to get up into consciousness and the stuff that doesn't? The answer is attention. So the stuff you pay attention to, that's the stuff that manages to get into consciousness. That's the global workspace theory, basically. The stuff you pay attention to is the stuff about, the information about which enters your consciousness. So if you pay attention to the cat, information about the cat is going to become conscious to you. It's going to be pulled up from the unconscious world into the conscious world. That's, that's the idea. Um, next slide, please. So there's three core ideas. Loads of information in the brain is unconscious, but it's really isolated from each other. It's hard for it to move in a non-linear way from different systems. It doesn't travel much. The conscious information is the stuff that's put up on a big global blackboard in the mind for tons of different systems to access all at once. It's the job of this workspace, which is here in the prefrontal cortex. Um, the job of that workspace is to allow lots of systems to access it all at once. And attention is the gatekeeper. Attention determines the elite, cool information, the good stuff that manages to get up into the workspace. That's the global workspace theory in essence. Uh, next. Uh, right, I've pushed my PowerPoint limits, my PowerPoint skills to their very limit, <laughs> right? And I've, I've drawn a diagram. I'm not going to say it's good, but it did take me all day, so uh, <laughs> if it's not good, then just, just lie to me, just say it. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so here's the global workspace theory. Here's how it goes. Step one, you look at a cat. The cat falls into your visual field. Light bounces off the cat, and it goes from the cat into your eyeballs. Once it's in your eyes, it gets translated into electrical signals, which pass through your midbrain to the very back of your brain. This is where visual cortex is, or uh, sometimes called occipital cortex, here at the back of your brain. Information about the cat, a lot of information, gets processed in visual cortex here at the back of the head entirely unconsciously. You're, there's nothing here that you're aware of, nothing going on. It's entirely unconscious. But important information triggers your attentional systems, and your attention then focuses on the cat. So your attention focuses on the cat, and that's going to push information about the cat from visual cortex through to this front bit, which is your global workspace system near your prefrontal cortex, also um, in a place called anterior cingulate cortex in the front of your brain, and then you're conscious of the cat. So it zips through the middle of your brain, goes to the back, and once it attracts attention, it goes to the front again and then becomes conscious. And then your other systems can access it. So other systems, uh, last bit, yeah. So once it's conscious, your, all your different systems can access it and they can, you can reason about it, you can use it. So you might, it might then be conscious and your long-term memory system might trigger something for you to think, oh shit, I was meant to feed the cat. And then your linguistic system might say, oh, I need to feed the cat or something. You know, that's kind of the idea. Once the representation of the cat is conscious, all those systems can then use that information to do what they need to do. Do you like my diagram? <laughs> Thank you. So this is something I really wanted to highlight, which is that the attention makes the difference from the information being unconscious to it being conscious. That was one of the things that the cocktail effect is meant to show, cocktail party effect. It's an old, old effect going back at least as far as the 50s, but Aristotle actually talks about it in one of his books in ancient Greek times. This idea that attention is the thing that makes the difference between unconsciousness and consciousness. So even, even in this big, sophisticated theory of consciousness, you still see that basic intuition, the 
cocktail party effect intuition, you still see that represented um, here. Uh, next. Okay, so here's, here's one of the problems for global workspace theory. Global workspace theory is one of the main premier theories of consciousness in science today. It's one of the big, respectable ones. Um, it's hard to really date when these things started, but it's generally thought to have started in its present form in the late 80s and 90s, um, with thinkers like Stanislaw Dehaene and various others who worked a lot on this. But here's one big objection to it, and there are many objections, but I think this is one of the main ones. Global workspace theory says that attention is the thing that makes the difference from unconsciousness to consciousness. But actually, you can kind of agree that attention and consciousness are really closely related without thinking that the only stuff that's conscious is the stuff you pay attention to. So if you imagine like just being on a train and daydreaming, your attention might completely and utterly wander from everything in front of you. But does that really mean that it disappears from your consciousness entirely? That's just a very extreme claim, and a lot of people don't like making that, that claim. So for a lot of people who don't like the theory, this is one of the places where they get off, get off the boat. A lot of people are quite keen on this idea that you're conscious of more than you pay attention to. So if, if you're just paying attention to me now, it doesn't feel like that exhausts your consciousness. Like, you're also kind of conscious of the stuff behind me, things like that. That's one of the main problems for global workspace theory. Uh, next. Okay, cool. So the next theory, the hot theory, I would have thought, or hot. <coughs> What's interesting about global workspace theory is that it originated mainly in science and is now discussed a lot by philosophers as well. I would have thought theory kind of went the other way. It originated in philosophy and is now discussed by a lot of scientists as well. But as I said at the start, what's cool about both these theories is that they very much straddle disciplines. So hot theory starts off in the same place as global workspace theory which is that there's loads of processing, most of it's unconscious, only the elite stuff manages to be conscious. Global workspace theory basically says the conscious stuff is the stuff that it's a very particular stage of processing. It's when that stuff reaches prefrontal cortex that it becomes conscious. Higher order thought theory says, no, 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 our mental states become conscious when we think about them. So it's thinking about your own mental states that makes them conscious. That's the idea. Uh, next. So here's another diagram. It's not quite as good, but higher order thought theory is not quite as complicated. So you look at the cat, information about the cat is processed unconsciously, but then you pay attention to your experience of the cat itself. So you think, I can see a cat now. Thinking about the experience is what makes it conscious. What's really weird about this view, or really interesting about it, is that what makes stuff conscious is not you paying attention to the cat. So it's not paying attention to the cat that makes it conscious, that makes your experience of it conscious. It's you paying attention to your own experience of the cat. So you can think about a cat all you like, and that won't make that experience conscious. It's you thinking about your experience of the cat that makes it conscious. So this is often called metacognition, where you're thinking about the contents of your own uh, mind. Nonetheless, you can see, oh, go back to the big red ring, you can see this basic idea, this cocktail party effect idea, that attention makes the difference between unconsciousness and consciousness. You can see that's here as well. It's preserved. So those two core ideas we started with, where the unconscious is the bottom of the iceberg and consciousness is just the tip, and that attention makes the difference between so being unconscious and being conscious, they're there in both of those theories. Um, so they're kind of similar in that regard. So here's the big problem for higher order thought theory. Here's the big, there are, there are many objections to it, but this is the biggest one, which, um, which is kind of the most obvious, but also one of the most devastating in my view, which is higher order thought theory requires that you need to think about your experience in order for it to be conscious. So like I said, looking at a cat, thinking about a cat, that doesn't do anything. You can think about the cat all you want, but it's only going to be conscious when you think about your own thoughts about the cat when you have this metacognitive thing, when, when you can represent your own thoughts about the cat. And that's a problem when it comes to non-human animals. Uh, next. So lots of people have got this idea that other animals, at least some other animals, not cats though, 
Not that. No, no, no. Not that. Absolutely not. <laughs> but lots of folk think that not, at least some non-human animals are conscious. <coughs> like dogs and horses presumably are conscious. But higher order thought theory implies that if, if an organism's mind is not sophisticated enough to think about its own mind, then it's not conscious at all. And that just looks quite extreme because it's such a sophisticated thing to have. So imagine a dog. So a dog presumably can think about its food. It can think about things like going for walks. It can, I don't know. I don't know what dogs think about, you know. But clearly, when you watch a dog catch a ball, it's clearly tracking the object. It's clearly predicting where it's going to go. And it's clearly acting in a rational way with respect to the, to the object. So we all sort of, most people agree that there's some sense in which dogs can think about objects. But can they really think about their own minds? That looks far, far more sophisticated. And as far as I'm aware, there's not much evidence from comparative psychology that dogs can, can do that. There is some. I nearly said there's no evidence that dogs can't, can think about their own minds. There is some, but um, there's, not, there's not loads. Here's the problem. Higher order thought theory says that if an organism's mind, yep, yeah, no, that's right. If an organism's mind is not sophisticated enough to think about its own thoughts, which is quite an advanced thing, then it can't be conscious. And that just looks really implausible because it seems to imply that things like dogs and horses can't be conscious, which most people, not all, but most people think is <laughs> implausible. So at this point, higher order thought theory's only got two options. They can either say, no, dogs and horses do have minds that are sophisticated enough to think about their own minds, but there's not much evidence for that. That's a very difficult claim to sustain. Or they can just say, well, dogs and horses aren't conscious then. But most people don't want to say that because it, it seems to go a bit against um, common sense. Although there are people who defend the view. There are some people who think um, that um, consciousness is, a, is just a human thing. It's a, it's a pretty minority idea. But there are some people who, who, who hold that. Uh, next. Okay, so I want to just summarise and then talk about three really big questions in consciousness science that I'm really into. So global workspace theory says that consciousness is the information that's encoded in a bit of the brain here, where loads of different systems can all access it at once. The problem for global workspace theory is that it seems to imply that you have to pay attention to something to be conscious of it, and that might seem a bit too strong. Uh, next, higher order thought theory says that consciousness arises when you think about the experience or when you think about the thought, but that looks quite extreme because it implies you can't be conscious unless you have concepts for your own mental states, and that seems to rule out a lot of non-human animals. Um, I should say, like, depending on how clever you think they are, higher order thought theory can say that stuff like chimps and gorillas are conscious, uh, maybe dolphins, um, depending on how you interpret the evidence, they can say some non-human animals are conscious. But it, it's, it's an uphill struggle, really, to, to try and argue that non-human animals are sophisticated enough to be conscious. Uh, next. Okay, so here are three open questions that I'm really, really interested in. Which, the first one is, when does consciousness emerge in the human lifespan? So presumably human adults are conscious. I think, I reckon I am. Presumably at some point I wasn't conscious, so I assume a sperm and an egg together aren't conscious. But where along the line does consciousness start to emerge? Is it when you're a toddler, that seems a bit late? Is it when you're born? Is it, are fetuses conscious? You know, at what point do they become conscious? That's a really interesting question. It's especially interesting because, of course, newborn babies can't tell you whether they're conscious because uh, they like language, um, and it's a particularly difficult thing to test. So I find that really, really interesting question. Uh, next. The next question is, how far down the evolutionary tree does consciousness go? Um, fans of, of animals might notice that these are the same animals that were on the previous slide, in a, in, a, in a very neat... These animals belong to my sister, and I'm replicating images of them now with her permission. Uh, um, how far down it does it go? Higher mammals, you know, cats, horses, dogs, most people think, yeah, probably. But what about bees? What about wasps? What about cockroaches? Snakes? Dragonflies? You know, it's really, really hard to tell. Uh, next. The final thing that I'm really into is whiskey. 
And this is the problem of sensory integration, which is a really cool problem, which is that all the different senses seem to be processed in different parts of the brain. Um, so taste, smell, vision all seem to be processed in separate systems. But if you were to drink whiskey, for example, you know, the sight, the smell, the sound of it, all those kinds of things, they don't seem to, you don't just get the sound of the ice and then the smell and then the taste of it. They all seem to be somehow unified as part of the same sensation. That's the problem of multisensory integration. How does information from across the senses get unified into one big experience? Um, that's something that I'm really into. So having raised those three um, big questions, obviously there's many more questions in consciousness science, those are three of the biggest ones. Uh, it only remains me. Uh, next slide to say thanks very much for your attention. Cheers. Thank you.